Hello everyone, welcome to Probability and Statistics for Data Science. Today we're going to talk about probability density, which is the most intuitive way of describing the behavior of a continuous random variable. Let's get to it. Our goal is to define the probability density and describe its properties. Let's remember the mathematical definition of continuous random variables. Mathematically, a continuous random variable is a function from um, a sample space within a probability space to the real line. But in general, we do not want to talk about the underlying probability space. We want to describe the random variable in terms of the probability that belongs to different intervals on the real line. And this is mathematically legitimate. We saw why in the video on the uh, mathematical definition of continuous random variables. So in practice, we describe continuous random variables in terms of the probability that they belong to any interval on the real line. How can we encode this information? In the video on the cumulative distribution function, we saw that the CDF, or cumulative distribution function, which is denoted by this big F with a subscript indicating what random variable it refers to, uh, is able to encode this information. Okay? We can compute the probability that the random variable belongs to any interval based on the CDF, which is the probability that the random variable is more or equal to any value on the real line. Okay, I'm going very quickly, but if you don't remember this stuff, just go to the video on cumulative distribution function. The CDF gives us the probability of being in, in any interval. We just need to take the CDF on the right and subtract the CDF on the left. So aren't we happy with this? We can completely describe a random variable using its CDF. We can compute the probability that it belongs to any union of intervals. So how about we just, you know, uh, use that? Well, the problem is that the CDF is a global quantity. If you look at the CDF at a particular value, it's a particular point of the real line. It's telling you the probability that, you know, you the random variable is in, a, is in the interval that goes up to there. But what if you're interested in what's going on with the random variable more locally? Okay, you want to characterize local behavior. You want to know if I start sampling, for example, around here, am I going to see a lot of samples or not if I take independent samples from this random variable? And for that, let's see how we would do it with the CDF. So here we would see nothing, right? Because the CDF is flat. That means that the probability of being in each of those intervals is zero because the CDF is the same on both ends of the interval. The probability of being here is going to be uniform in the sense that any interval is going to have a probability that is um, proportional to its length because the CDF is linear. We discussed this in the video on CDFs. So here we're going to see some samples that are going to be kind of uniformly distributed. Here again, we see that this guy is flat. The CDF is flat. So the probability of being in any of those intervals is zero. No samples there. And here we see that on this here, 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 here. So here on this, in this arrow, the CDF is flatter. So there's going to be less probability for the same length. And here, suddenly the slope goes up. So that means that the change in probability for the same length is going to, is not the change in probability, the probability for the same length when we subtract the CDF at one end and the CDF on the other end is going to be larger. So we expect to see more samples here and less samples here. So what you can see is that um, the CDF just visually does not give us a good description of what's going on locally. Um, what's going on locally? What's the local behavior of this probability density? Oh, probability density. No, this is not a probability density, right? Of this random variable. Instead, what we're kind of doing in our heads is differentiating this CDF, right? Because we're taking differences. And this already gives it a little bit away, right? We're going to define an object that is the derivative of the CDF, which actually captures the local behavior. Uh, let's take a look at what this object, which is the probability density, actually means. The probability density gives us the probability per unit length when we consider very, very uh, narrow intervals. So if we consider an interval which has um, length or width epsilon, the probability of being within that interval can be expressed as the product of the length of the interval times the density once we take the length of the interval to zero. That's what the density means. 
So here, if we have the density, this is not the CDF, that's important to point out. This is the density. If we know the density of probability, then we can compute the probability that a random variable is in a certain interval by multiplying the density with the length of the interval. So this is why I've colored this in. That area, because this is the density and this is the length of the interval, that area is the probability that the random variable is there. So the good thing about this is that immediately, if the density is high, that means that the probability of intervals around that region um, have higher probability okay, for the same length. So, so this immediately captures this local behavior that we wanted to capture. Okay, so how do we define the uh, density? We want it to be equal to the probability of being in an interval divided by the length of that interval in the limit where epsilon goes to zero. Now, if we express this in terms of the CDF, this is just the CDF at A minus the CDF at A minus epsilon divided by epsilon. This is just the definition of derivative. It's the slope of the CDF, which connects with the intuition that we had when we tried to derive local behavior from the CDF. Okay? And this is how we define the density. It's the derivative of the CDF. So notice that, by the way, to have a well-defined probability density, a random variable needs to have a CDF that is differentiable. If it's not differentiable at certain points, that's okay because those points have zero probability if it's a continuous random variable. Okay, so in general, um, we saw that the CDF does not really capture the global behavior. Let's take a look at the derivative. The, the derivative actually captures the, the local, not the global behavior, sorry. The CDF does not capture the local behavior, but the PDF captures the local behavior beautifully. So here we see immediately that the, we're going to get some samples there that are uniformly distributed if we start sampling independently from the random variable. And here we see that there's you know, more density here than here. This captures the fact that if we sample, we're going to see more samples towards the right of this interval than towards the left. And zero density basically means that we're not going to see any intervals there. Okay, again, in, in my opinion at least, a much more intuitive way of um, describing the behavior of the random variable visually. The mathematical definition of probability density function is the derivative of the CDF is the CDF is differentiable at that point. Again, intuitively, it captures probability per length. So now let's take a look at the uniform distribution. We had derived that the uniform distribution um, where the CDF was linear in the video on the CDF, we, have de we had derived that the probability of being in each interval was proportional to the length of the interval. So now what is the PDF of this random variable? Since the CDF here is just equal to u, the derivative of u is equal to 1, it has constant density. Again, a very intuitive way that a very intuitive description of the behavior of the random variable that immediately tells us that the density of samples that we're going to obtain if we start sampling from the random variable is going to be uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. And this is how we define uniform distributions. A uniform distribution in the interval a, b has um, constant, constant density between a and b. Re realize that we have to divide by b minus a, we will see in a moment why we need to do that. I'll come back to that point. So before that, can a PDF be larger than 1? Because a CDF cannot, right? Because a CDF is a probability. A PDF, in fact, can. So if you have, for example, a uniform PDF between 0 and 0 0.5, you can check that the height of the PDF is going to be 2. Because the probability is not given by the height of the PDF, um, you have to multiply. You have to take into account the length of the interval. And related to that point, let's take a look at how to compute probabilities using the PDF. Uh, a probability, and usually when we consider probabilities, it's useful to go through the CDF of a random variable because the CDF has a direct interpretation in terms of probabilities, and then we can usually translate this to to densities. Uh, for an interval that goes from A to B. The probability that the random variable is in there is the CDF at B minus the CDF at A. But this is just equal to the integral from A to B of the derivative of the CDF. 
This is just by basic calculus. And that derivative is the PDF. So we need to integrate the PDF from A to B. That gives us the area under this PDF, I'll show you a picture in a moment, which connects to our intuition at the beginning when we were talking in terms of the probability being an area and the PDF being the height and the length of the interval uh, being the length, the, you know, the length of the, of the rectangle. For any countable, before that though, let's take a look at what happens for a disjoint, uh, for a union of disjoint intervals. If we're interested in the probability that a random variable is in a countable union of disjoint intervals, we already saw in the video on the mathematical definition of continuous random variables that we can express this as the sum of the probabilities that the random variable is in each of the intervals. That's equal to the integral of the PDF. But now what is the sum of these integrals? It's just the integral over the union of the intervals. Okay. So basically, what I'm saying is that if you want the probability that a random variable is here or here, you just need to integrate the PDF, which means that you need to compute, maybe this is not the best color, <laughs> well, but anyways, you need to compute the area under the PDF for the set that you're interested in. And as long as that set can be expressed as a union of countable intervals, so if you want to get mathematically fancy, it's a Borel set, then you're going to be able to compute that probability from the PDF by integrating it. Okay. So the PDF also captures, uh, the, also completely describes the behavior of a random variable, just like the CDF does. And again, it produces a much more intuitive description of the local behavior. Okay, so let's take a look at some properties of a PDF. First of all, are PDFs always non-negative? So remember that CDFs are non-negative because they're probabilities. PDFs are non-negative, but for a different reason. The, diff the reason is that they're the derivative of the CDF and the CDF is non-decreasing. So then the PDF cannot be negative because that would mean that the, um, the CDF would be decreasing, right? If you have a negative derivative, that means that you're decreasing. What about the integral of a PDF over the real line? Well, what is that equal to? Is the probability that the random variable is in any part of the real line and that probability is equal to one. So, PDFs always integrate to one, which is why when we were defining the uniform distribution, we had to divide by the length of the interval so that that little rectangle would have area one and be a valid PDF. It turns out that any non-negative function that integrates to one is a valid PDF. If you're very mathematically inclined, you might ask, but wait a minute. We need an underlying probability space. What's going on? Well, it turns out that we can reverse engineer the underlying probability space. In fact, what, we, what you can do is you can say that the um, sample space of the probability space is just a real line. The um, collection of events within that probability space are the Borel sets. So basically any set of the real line that can be expressed as a countable union of intervals. And then you can assign probabilities. You can define the probability measure um, by assigning probabilities to those uh, Borel sets according to the density. Again, this is super mathematical. It's not very interesting. We never do this, but it's just so, you know, if, if someone, some mathematician tries to bully you because you're estimating PDFs from data, you can say, no, no, I know that the underlying probability space exists because we can reverse engineer, but it's not a super important point. Okay, so what have we learned? We have learned the definition and the properties of the probability density function, which again is probably the most intuitive way of characterizing the behavior of continuous random variables. Thank you very much.